Hello everyone and welcome to The Shit Show. My quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture brings me at last to the year 2012, which means for the first time in a long time, I am revisiting The Twilight Saga. This is indeed where it all began for my YouTube career. The first Twilight movie was the subject of Episode 1 of Cinematic Excrement, technically before I had officially named the show. It was 2009, hating Twilight was still the cool thing to do, and I hopped right on that bandwagon. I'm not denying it. And for better or worse, it kind of defined my channel for a while. I think my Team Mustache Dad rant in my original review for Breaking Dawn Part 2 may have been my first entry on TV tropes, though I'm sure many people will correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Since then, I have thankfully been able to move on to other terrible movies, though some have been at least Twilight adjacent, but I guess I couldn't escape those sparkly vampires forever. And my recent Transformers movie retrospective went pretty well, so what the hell? It's been a few years, I'm older, and in theory, more mature. So why don't we do a retrospective on the Twilight Saga? Of course, Twilight began with a book by Stephanie Meyer wherein her obvious self-insert character Isabella Swan, or Bella to her friends, which is seemingly everyone as she is inexplicably popular despite having no discernible personality, moves to the small town of Forks, Washington and meets super dreamy stud muffin Edward Cullen. She becomes completely obsessed with Edward and vice versa, but it turns out Edward has a dark and terrible secret. He's a vampire. Well, dark may not be the right adjective. He's actually quite the opposite. This is what I am. I mean, it's creative, I'll give her that. I confess I haven't read the entire novel. Oh, I've tried, believe me, but Meyer's writing style is... challenging. And by challenging, I mean bad. Her prose is janky as hell and there's very little that actually happens. In fact, what I've described so far is basically 70% of the book. Edward likes Bella, Bella likes Edward, Edward is a vampire, that's it. At some point, Meyer must have realized, oh crap, I wrote 400 pages and forgot to include a plot, and that's when a trio of evil vampires show up and one of them, James, decides he must have Bella for lunch. This does not end well for him. And Edward takes Bella to the prom, the end. And that is the best-selling book of 2008. I'm as surprised as you. Granted, I am not at all in the target audience. This is a book for teen and tween girls. And their moms, somehow. And I'm not going to pretend I was any better, and neither should you. No one can say they had impeccable taste at that age. But my god, surely there were better choices. Twilight doesn't seem like the best thing for impressionable young minds to dive into. Not just because the writing is terrible, but because Edward and Bella's relationship is... well... I know the word problematic is overused nowadays, but it applies for the age gap alone. Edward and Bella are both physically 17, but Edward was turned into a vampire when his adopted father Carlisle found him dying of Spanish flu. So think about how long ago that was, and yeah, he's dating a girl about 90 years his junior. And you thought Leonardo DiCaprio had issues. And there's really no explanation for why they're so obsessed with each other apart from the physical attraction. I have no idea what these two have in common. And there's also the fact that Edward, who claims to be in love with Bella, also repeatedly reminds her he wants to eat her. Welcome to Red Flag Central, ladies and gentlemen. So yeah, it occurs to me Twilight may not be giving its target audience the best idea of what a healthy relationship might look like, and there are probably much better books they could be reading instead. And I find the most common response to this sort of criticism is, hey, at least they're reading. And to that I say, is the bar really that low? Don't answer that. All this having been said, there are far worse things people could be reading as well. <clears throat> and I'm not going to suggest these books should be banned or anything. That's a step too far. There's enough book burning going on nowadays and we don't need to make that problem worse. Hell, I'm a little surprised Twilight hasn't been on conservatives' radar. As soon as they find out these books have an interracial love triangle, they'll throw Twilight on that bonfire faster than you can say critical race theory. The point I'm trying to make is if anyone wants to keep reading Twilight, fine. I don't get it, but I don't have to get it. And as long as they understand that real-world relationships are not and should not be like Bella and Edward, no harm, no foul. Anyway, due to the runaway success of Meyer's novel, Hollywood came a-callin' and Summit Entertainment turned Twilight into a major motion picture, 
directed by Katherine Hardwick and starring Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart as Edward the Sparkly Vampire and Bella the... Bella. And much to the surprise of no one, it was terrible. Due to the subpar quality of the novel, expectations were low but holy shit. Granted, they did at least attempt to improve on the novel a bit by introducing the evil vampires earlier in the movie, so they didn't just come out of nowhere in the last act. But that's about the only point I'll give it because it's otherwise a really poorly made movie. The direction is terrible, the editing is atrocious, the special effects are laughably bad, the story is stupid as hell, Edward and Bella's relationship is yeesh. I like watching you sleep. Bella, run. And I still don't understand what they see in each other. Literally, the only thing they have in common is they both like Debussy's Claire de Lune. I mean, it's nice to see they have decent musical taste, but surely you should have something more? It doesn't make sense for you to love me. Right? And everything is tinted blue as if the movie is stuck in a permanent day for night shot. I haven't seen this much blue since I know who killed me. Twilight was an absolute mess. But it was a profitable mess because, as previously established, teenagers do not have impeccable taste. And that meant green lights for the sequels. And thus, we got a big screen adaptation of the second book in the series, New Moon. And in the words of Han Solo, this is where the fun begins. Catherine Hardwick was out, and Chris Weitz was brought in to direct, and the quality did noticeably go up. The editing wasn't as sloppy, the constant blue tint was gone, it was a much better made movie. Also, as I said in my original review, New Moon is hilarious. I'm sure it wasn't supposed to be, but it ended up that way nonetheless, and I am not complaining. Because he doesn't want to hurt Bella, and the residents of Forks are starting to realize the Cullens don't age, Edward skips town and breaks it off with Bella. This somehow leads to Bella seeing visions of Edward, or Obi-Wan Jabroni as I call him, whenever she does something dangerous, like hitching a ride with some random biker dude. And what the f*** is this guy doing hitting on a high school girl? He looks like he's my age. Granted, that is still a smaller age gap than the one between Edward and Bella, but still. And of course, this is where Jacob loses his god-awful wig, seriously, they can't have thought that looked good, and becomes a werewolf. Although he's really more of a shapeshifter that turns into a direwolf. But hey, this movie gave birth to sparkly vampires. Why should Meyer start following the rules now? And all of these werewolves constantly walk around shirtless, which I'm sure resonated well with the target audience. And on one hand, I suppose it makes sense. The more clothing they wear, the more they have to replace when they shapeshift. That doesn't keep it from being one of the most homoerotic things I have ever seen. And I watch pro wrestling. And this is the start of the love triangle with Edward, Bella, and Jacob, which mainly consists of Jacob constantly bitching and moaning about being in the friend zone, and boy does that get old. It takes three goddamn movies for him to finally get over Bella, and, well, we'll get to that. New Moon also introduced us to the best part of the Twilight Saga, and his name is Michael Sheen. <laughs> Remarkable. So at some point, Edward gets the idea that Bella is dead and decides to expose himself to the world. No, not like that. But also... Kind of like that? I don't know. And I somehow didn't notice this the first time around, but why is his shirt torn? I don't think that's ever explained. Did we miss a scene? Anyway, Bella stops him from doing something incredibly stupid, and we meet the secret society of pretentious evil vampire overlords known as the Volturi, the leader of which is Aro. Aro is hands down the best character in the Twilight Saga, and it's not even close. And that's largely due to Sheen's performance. Some actors chew the scenery, Sheen unhinges his jaw and swallows it whole. And this is nothing new for Sheen, as anyone who has seen his performance as Nero in the BBC docudrama Ancient Rome, The Rise and Fall of an Empire, will attest. It's a bit difficult to find on this side of the pond unless you subscribe to BritBox, but it is possible to find via <clears throat> alternate means. One way or another, you absolutely should see the Nero episode of Ancient Rome purely for Sheen's insanity. The gods need protection from it's not Stop it. enough! Shh. It's not Stop. enough! I will stand before them again. And I will say. Don't any of you dare say there's no money! Don't you dare! That is a man who loves his work. But although New Moon gave us considerable entertainment value, it also supplied the Twilight Saga with another problematic relationship because one wasn't bad enough. Meet Sam and Emily. That massive scar on Emily's face? Sam did that. Yeesh. And the way Jacob explains it just adds to the yeesh. Sam got angry. 
Lost it for a split second and was standing too close. He'll never be able to take that back. Jesus, Meyer, you make it sound like Sam is the victim here. He ain't the one with the face that looks like a roadmap. Anyway, after the madness that was New Moon, we got the relative mediocrity that was Eclipse. The evil vampire Victoria has been recast and is now played by Bryce Dallas Howard, who is way too good for this franchise. So is Anna Kendrick, by the way. They both deserve better, but I digress. Victoria has raised an army of newborn vampires with the sole purpose of killing Bella. Even though it was Edward and the rest of the Cullens who killed her mate James, Bella didn't have a damn thing to do with that. But hey, I shouldn't expect this shit to start making sense now. And it's up to an uneasy alliance of vampires and werewolves to stop Victoria because Edward and Jacob aren't about to let anyone kill their woman. Sadly, Aro is absent from this one, and the most prominent member of the Volturi present in this movie, Jane, played by Dakota Fanning, leaves something to be desired. She gives a very subdued performance, especially by comparison. That's not to say there aren't any amusing moments in the movie. Eclipse did give us this. Uh, come on! Come! Still funny. And I swear this shot of the Cullens looks like the cover for a symphonic metal album. I'm not sure that's what director David Slade was going for, but you see it too, right? And as the series progresses, we continue to get bits of backstory from several other characters that shows basically every character in Twilight is far more interesting than Bella, who is supposed to be the focus of the story. I mean, it's almost comical how much of a blank slate she is compared to the supposed side characters. And this gets even worse as we get into Breaking Dawn. Speaking of which, this was the fourth and final, at the time, book in the series. And this is where Twilight said, hey... We should totally split our last book into two movies. It worked for Harry Potter. Twice the movies, twice the ticket sales, twice the money. And from a business standpoint, it was clearly the right call as Breaking Dawn Parts 1 and 2, which were filmed back to back, brought in about one and a half billion dollars combined. And this trend of splitting finales into two movies continued with the Hunger Games series, which also made well over a billion dollars for Mockingjay Parts 1 and 2, and the Divergent series, which, well, <laughs> that did not work. Allegiant failed so spectacularly at the box office that its second part, Ascendant, was initially converted from a theatrical film to a made-for-TV movie, but even that never got off the ground and the Divergent film series remains unfinished. And then Peter f***ing Jackson comes along and says, Splitting one book into two movies? Child's play. I can do three. And I'll film them in 3D at 48 frames a second because I can. I apologize for subjecting you all to my terrible New Zealand accent. Anyway, uh... What are we talking about? Oh yeah, Breaking Dawn. Splitting this into two parts may have made sense from a business standpoint, but from a storytelling standpoint, my god this dragged ass. Here's what happens in part one. Bella and Edward get married. He somehow knocks her up despite being, you know, dead. She gives birth to Renesmee. And thanks to Elon and Grimes, that is no longer the dumbest baby name I've ever heard. And she finally achieves her year-long dream and becomes a vampire. I just listed everything that happens in this movie in one minute. Well, almost everything, but we'll get to that. And its running time is just under two hours. And that's not counting the extended version. Oh yes, there is an extended version. Science has still not been able to explain why. Like Harry Potter before it and The Hunger Games after it, Breaking Dawn absolutely did not need to be split into two movies. There's just not enough story here. And not enough Aro. He doesn't even show up until the mid credit scene in part one. And if the mid credit scene is the best part of your movie, you're doing something wrong. Probably several things, actually. Everything gets unnecessarily dragged out, starting with the wedding, where everyone and their mother has to give a speech for some reason. I've been to several weddings, and I don't think I've ever seen one with more than three speeches tops. But I guess I shouldn't be surprised Meyer doesn't know what a typical American wedding looks like, since she's LDS, and their weddings are... different. Y'all can research that on your own. We don't have time. Then there's the honeymoon, which goes on forever because Bella keeps trying to get Edward to have more sex with her, but Edward refuses because he doesn't want to hurt her again. Hey, Eddie baby, there's a very simple solution here. Just let her be on top. Tenacious D already explained this one, man. Come on. And of course, there's the pregnancy, which also feels like it takes forever, even though the half-vampire fetus is supposedly growing much faster than a normal human would. And the final sequence where Bella transforms into a vampire, 
Good God, they really wanted to hit that two hour runtime, didn't they? To be fair, there are some good things that happened in the movie. For starters, we actually learned something about Edward. Took four movies, but we got there, and what we learned is kind of hilarious in hindsight because Robert Pattinson once said in an interview that when he first read Twilight, he thought Edward sounded like an axe murderer. Turns out he wasn't far off, as shortly after becoming a vampire, Edward did go through a serial killer phase. And boy, that sounds weird when I say it out loud. Granted, he was more the Dexter variety of serial killer as he only killed horrible people, rapists and the like, and I can't really hate him for that, but it's still funny that Pattinson called that one. You know what else is funny? The bed the morning after their wedding night. She wanted more of that? God, I hope she had a safe word. But there are some bad things that happen too, like the abortion debate. Yes, Twilight actually went there. I already talked about this in my original review, but I will reiterate there is nothing wrong with talking about abortion or other controversial topics in pop culture. But such a discussion requires a certain level of maturity. And I think it's safe to say the movie about sparkly vampires never hit that level. Like I said, Breaking Dawn would have worked much better as a single film. In fact, you probably could say the same for New Moon and Eclipse. I mean, what actually happens in New Moon? Bella and Edward break up, Jacob turns into a werewolf, Bella and Edward get back together, ha 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 remarkable, the end. It's not until Eclipse when we get into Victoria and her vampire army that we get anything resembling an actual plot. Victoria pops up a couple of times in New Moon just to remind us she still exists, but it doesn't go anywhere. One could easily combine both stories into one movie. Check this out. Edward and the Cullens leave Forks because Edward thinks Bella will be safer without them, Jacob swoops in to begin the love triangle, Victoria starts raising her vampire army to get revenge for James' death, the increased vampire presence causes new Quileute werewolves to awaken, including Jacob, Alice gets a vision of the vampire army, Edward realizes leaving Bella alone was a mistake, and the Cullens return, forming an uneasy alliance with the wolves, they has fight, the Volturi arrive once the dust has settled to clean up the mess, Aro meets Bella and learns about her plan to become a vampire, Edward proposes, roll credits. There you go, Twilight. I just gave your saga proper pacing. Anyway, we have finally come to the reason I made this video in the first place, the only movie in the Twilight Saga to win the Razzie for Worst Picture, Breaking Dawn Part 2. When we last left our... heroes? Bella had given birth to Renesme and turned into a vampire. Oh, and Jacob imprinted on baby Renesme, thus ensuring he would watch over her as she grew up and they would eventually become a couple once she was old enough. Some people might call this behavior grooming. I mean, Republicans wouldn't because there isn't a drag queen involved, but anyone else. Bella reacts to this news as one might expect she would. You imprinted on my daughter? It wasn't my choice. She's a baby! It's not like that. Oh really? It's not like that? Because it kinda sounds like it's like that. Yeah, as if this movie's romantic relationships weren't already problematic enough, they had to make Jacob a groomer. Granted, this movie is very quick to call out how weird this is as Bella beats the ever-loving shit out of Jacob, while Edward is hilariously content to sit back and watch. This is a rare moment in the Twilight Saga. It's funny on purpose. Not accidentally funny like this flashback scene where Jane throws a vampire child onto a fire. Yes, I laughed at that, and yes, I am aware that I'm going to hell. But anyway, Bella is rightly pissed off at Jacob imprinting on Renesmee, but then she accepts the situation after, like, two minutes. And it's never addressed again. Well, Twilight, congratulations on... almost taking a stand? I guess? This is also the movie that introduced us to creepy CGI babyface. Oh dear god, why? Why? Who looked at this and thought it was a good idea? And why are they not in prison? The weird thing is, the special effects had actually gotten better as the series progressed. The wolves looked so much better in Breaking Dawn than they did in New Moon. And then they gave us this nightmare fuel. One step forward, two steps back. And yet, it could have been worse. The original plan was not to use CGI, but a mechanical doll. And that doll... Ooh. There's a reason why the cast and crew came to call it Chuck Esme. Once you see the doll, which the cast reportedly hated, you realize why they wanted to paste over it with CGI. What they ended up with was still creepy as hell, but I confess, it is an improvement. So they made the well, hmm... I don't want to say right call. They made the less wrong call. We'll put it that way. 
It still doesn't explain why they pasted CGI faces on the rest of the child actors, though. I mean, could they not find kids that looked enough like Mackenzie Foy? And even if they couldn't, would the audience have cared? Anyway, the plot of this movie, yes it does have one, involves the Volturi mistakenly thinking the Cullens have turned a child into a vampire, which is a big no-no, and they plan to move against them. So the Cullens gather up witnesses from various racial stereotypes to stand for them. One of which is Rami Malek, by the way. I'd forgotten he was in this. Add him to the list of actors too good for this franchise. In fact, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. Pattinson and Stewart are too good for this franchise. Yeah, you heard me. I've seen them in other movies, and I know for a fact they can both act. Twilight just wouldn't let them. Part of that may be the script didn't give them much to work with, but I put some of the blame on the directors, too. Imagine how much better this franchise could have been if they were allowed to perform to the best of their abilities. My show would have taken a different direction, I'll tell you that. Getting back to the movie, Aro and company eventually realize their mistake when they discover Rendesme has a heartbeat and therefore can't be a vampire child. You know, after all these years, it occurs to me that that may very well be Michael Sheen's O-Face. Good luck trying to sleep tonight with that image in your head. But they decide to kill the Cullens anyway just for funsies. And even if you haven't seen the movie, you've probably heard about what happens. There is a massive battle which is surprisingly well done, especially by the standards of this franchise. It's just enough to give the audience a taste of what an actual good movie might look like. But then... The rug pull. That's your future. Unless you decide on another course. I still cannot believe they went there. They give us this huge friggin' battle, which was not in the book, although I understand it was hinted at, and I can't even begin to imagine what the fans must have been thinking at that time. They must have been losing their minds. Several characters die who did not die in the book, including a few of the Cullens, and then just as Aro is about to go up in flames, just kidding, it was all a dream. I mean, I do respect that they tried to do something different and more exciting than the book's very anticlimactic ending where they just talk it out and that's it. But it was still kind of a dick move. There is a note on IMDb stating the original plan was for the fight to be real and not just Alice's premonition, and director Bill Condon was supposedly on board with it. But while Meyer was fine with including the fight, since even she recognized her book's ending was weak, she wouldn't let them kill off anyone who didn't die in the book and insisted on the twist ending. But I have not been able to verify that anywhere else, and screenwriter Melissa Rosenberg, who wrote all five movies, hadn't deviated from Meyer's vision up to this point, and I can't imagine she'd suddenly start now. Personally, I would have been perfectly happy if this had been the real ending, but then I had no personal connection to this story. I imagine the Twihards may have felt differently, and ultimately this movie was for them. So I get why they went with the twist. But I still hate it. Anyway, the Volturi acknowledge the hybrid child isn't a threat, and they are not eager to die today, so they piss off, and that's the end of the movie. And that's the end of the Twilight Saga. The Razzies rewarded this final chapter with 11 nominations, one for every category that year, and seven wins, including Worst Picture. And it's not just the only Twilight movie to win that award, it's only the second Twilight movie to win any award! Believe it or not, prior to Breaking Dawn Part 2, the Twilight Saga only had one Razzie to its name. That came when Jackson Rathbone won Worst Supporting Actor for his roles in Eclipse and The Last Airbender. Prior to Eclipse, New Moon received a few nominations, but this did not include Worst Picture, and the first Twilight movie wasn't even nominated in any category. At first, that may sound surprising. One would think Twilight would be an easy target for the Razzies. However, with the benefit of hindsight, the Razzie voters were right not to shower these movies with their stupid awards. Was Twilight the worst movie of 2008? No. New Moon in 2009? No way. Not one Razzie nomination for that one, by the way. What the hell? Anyway. Eclipse in 2010? Please. Breaking Dawn Part 1 in 2011? Sandman took that one. And as for 2012... You know, I think I gotta give it to the Sandman again, although Oogie Loves is a very close second. But yeah, that means I am going on record as saying Breaking Dawn Part 2 did not deserve Worst Picture. Hell, Breaking Dawn Part 2 is the best movie in the Twilight Saga and the closest it came to being good. 
It didn't quite get there, but they tried. If any Twilight movie should have escaped the wrath of the Razzie voters, it was this one. Suddenly showering a Twilight movie with awards after largely letting them slide feels like they were making up for not being part of the anti-Twilight trend. This was the last movie in the saga, after all, and if they were gonna hop on the hate wagon, it was now or never. And I really don't think they needed to do that. This may sound strange coming from me, especially since I'm probably as guilty of this as anyone else, but Twilight got more hate than it deserved. Yeah, I said it. Don't get me wrong, they're bad movies, but look at some of the crap I've reviewed on this show. I've seen worse paranormal romance movies, I've seen worse love stories, hell, I've seen worse movies adapted from Stephanie Meyer novels. Yeah, remember this trash heap? If not, lucky you. But basically, a girl named Melanie has her body taken over by an alien host known as Wanderer. And the alien falls in love with a human named Ian, but Melanie, who is still conscious within her own body, although she no longer has control over it, has her own boyfriend and wants nothing to do with Ian. Which leads to this line. Is there any way Melanie can give us some, some privacy? Look the other way a moment. Do you think we could use Melanie's body for intimate purposes even though she clearly doesn't want us to? Wait, is there a word for that? Say what you will about the relationships in Twilight, at least they never got rapey, and if re-watching these movies has taught me nothing else, and it likely hasn't, the entire Twilight saga isn't that bad. Even the first movie, poorly made as it is, is far from the worst of all time, and even if the movies aren't necessarily good, they are still enjoyable in their own way, especially with the riff tracks. Peeing. Peeing. I am peeing! Ah, oh, whatever. Still peeing. So once again, I say thank you, Twilight Saga, for giving us hours of entertainment, even if it may not necessarily have been in the way you intended. And if I was too harsh on you in the past, mea culpa. Next time, we are going to look at a terrible anthology comedy movie. Well, it can't be worse than the underground comedy movie. Can it?